what what advice or what insight comes from this as it pertains to a person who's listening to this? And by definition, half the people listening to this are probably at a body weight above where they want to be. What's the takeaway, right? Is In it, terms it, of pregnancy? No, no. Just in terms of overall weight loss. Like how, how do we get, a, you know, we're sitting here in this environment that is, you know, almost deliberately trying to put weight on us. We're not going to get any help from our ancestors because the reality of it is <laughs> our ancestors didn't care if we gained weight. Quite happy to have us gain weight, actually. They just want to make sure we don't starve. Um, and so what can they do? And more importantly, how do they keep it off? Because as you said, most people can lose weight. But the keeping it off is really, uh, it, it poses a challenge. Yeah, so I think that... I'm, I'm going to take this as a question about on the individual level, which I assume is what you meant. Yeah. Um, so I think that there are a couple of different things to think about. Um, I think that for people who have, um, for people who have obesity, uh, bottom mass index 30, 35, I think it's worthwhile to consider medical treatment. So something like semaglutide, for example, the tools that we have now are just way better than what they used to be. That's a separate topic we could talk about. Um, but semaglutide, as far as we can tell, it's a very safe drug. It causes something like 18% weight loss, um, which is much better than the typical effect you're going to see in diet and lifestyle uh, strategies. But like diet and lifestyle, it's something you have to maintain. So I think at this point, now that the tools are getting better, particularly now that the tools are getting better, I would recommend seeing an obesity medicine specialist. I think for people who are, you know, experiencing substantially impaired quality of life or really concerned about the health impacts um, about you know if we switch the focus to people who might just want to lose a few pounds or who are overweight where they're not in as uh, perhaps not as serious a situation I think the brain so your appetite and your body fatness are very much regulated by your brain based on inputs that your brain is receiving and so, and a lot of that is non-conscious. And so the approach that I like to take is to try to give the non-conscious brain signals that are going to be more consistent with your goals, signals that are going to tell your brain to regulate things in a, in a more slimming direction. And that way you're not relying on heavy exercise of willpower all the time, which I don't think is really sustainable or effective for most people you are, instead of setting up a scenario where you're, you have these non-conscious urges that you're having to fight with your conscious brain, you're addressing the non-conscious urges directly so there is no, is no fight. That's, the, that's what I prefer. And so I think controlling these signals that your brain is receiving is, is really important. And there are different ways to do that. One of them is to control your food environment so the sensory cues in your environment that your brain is exposed to, whether there is food in your immediate vicinity, how tempting that food is, um, how hard you have to work for it. So like if you can just grab it and put it in your mouth, that's not as good as if you have to, you know, walk into a room and then peel an orange before you can eat it. Um, just little effort barriers like that. And then, um, and then with the types of food we're eating, there are, um, there's a wide variation in the number of calories that it takes to feel satisfied at a meal, depending on what foods you're eating. So typically, a typical person sits down and eats food until they feel satisfied and then they stop eating. That is the um, intuitive typical, natural, easy way of interacting with food. But depending on what's on your plate, that point can be reached with vastly different numbers of calories. 
So if you're eating, so, so is the is the proximate sign of satiation more um, a gastric distension function in that immediate uh, cessation mode? Oh, that's that's a great question. Um, I don't know. So okay, I, that is important. I, I can say that it's important. But if I were to like assign what percentage of the effect is attributable to that, I don't know what percentage I would put on it. Like, is that more than 50%? Um, I think it's a very complex system. The brain is receiving a lot of signals. Some of them are stomach distension. Some of them are signals from the small intestine about what the nutrient composition is. Uh, some of them are simply sensory or a sensory detection of food properties and stimulating uh, your brain knows based on those sensory properties what the nutritional composition of the food is based on prior experience that it has stored. So there's a lot of stuff going on that contributes to ultimately that sensation of uh, satiety, satiation would be the, the proper term for it, and, uh, and satisfaction that causes us to end a meal. Certainly stomach distension is, is a biggie, yeah. So anyway, so that relates to calorie density, which is an important determinant of the satiating and satiety promoting properties of, of food. So in other words, how many calories are there per gram or per volume of this food? If you have a food that has more volume per calories, fills up your stomach more, it stimulates those stretch receptors more, that goes up to your brain stem, and that's a signal that opposes further food intake. And then uh, protein, so more protein is more satiating per calorie. Um, palatability, the better something tastes, the less it fills you up per calorie. And I'm actually not sure how to disentangle that from um, calorie density. I'm not sure how much of, like, what's the independent variable there and what's the dependent variable or is it some of both? I don't know the answer to that. Um, but they're both strongly correlated with uh, lower satiety. And there, I've also seen these experiments where people are drinking from a bowl or a cup and it's being refilled constantly versus one where it just kind of runs out. I mean, what are the differences in how much people consume based on just, I mean, I notice this in myself. Like I'm eating, I put a little too much in the bowl but I eat it anyway because it's like, oh, I got to finish this thing. And if I had finished it 10 bites earlier, I would have been totally happy. Mm, Again, mm -hmm. I don't know how much that matters, right? Does that, does that type of behavior factor in the long tail here? Or is that just an acute thing that is sort of irrelevant in terms of, you know, optimal weight maintenance? I think it's very plausible. But the problem is that stuff comes from Brian Wansink. And so it pretty much got blown up. He was the guy at Cornell that kind of, did he falsify a bunch of data or something? I don't think there is clear evidence that he falsified. I think there are at least he hacked I'm, a lot of it pretty badly. Oh yeah, really yeah. badly. And and there are some data where it's not clear where they came from and they're very implausible. Uh, so I I don't I don't know how strong the evidence is that there was actual fabrication. I think there may have been some evidence of that. Um, I don't know where that landed, but basically there were a bunch of problems and yeah, he got blown up. So um, I would say that anything that has his name on it at this point is pretty suspect. Yeah. And the the soup, the refilling soup bowls was one of his classic experiments. Um, and I'm just going to disclose that I did cite one of his studies in my book. So I wasn't immune for, uh, from getting taken in by some of this stuff. <laughs>